Thanks very much for that intro, Brian. Uh, we're excited to be talking with you today. Uh, first, introduce myself. My name is Chuck. I'm a mechanical engineer at Wonder Workshop, and I'm going to be talking to you about the plastics, materials, and the internal components that make up the Dash robot. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan, and I'm the electrical engineer at Wonder Workshop, and we'll be talking about Dash's electronic system. Hi, my name is uh, Francis, and I'm on the firmware team at Wonder Workshop. And today I'll be talking to you about firmware, what it is, and what it does. Hey, my name is David. Uh, I'm a roboticist. I'll be talking a little bit about how Dash's control systems make use of everything that Chuck, Jonathan, and Francis are going to talk about to make Dash do some interesting things like dancing and driving accurately. All right, great. So that's our team there. And uh, just to get us started, I'm going to show you something which is uh, hopefully familiar to, to most of us, which is Dash Robot here. And I happen to have a, a pretty special version of Dash, which uh, has translucent plastics. Uh, the main plastic used for the housing is called ABS. It's very common. Uh, you probably see this plastic on, on devices around your house, like a TV remote, or um, if you have an Alexa device, an alarm clock, it's pretty, pretty common for consumer electronics. Anyway, this is a special resin that allows us to see into the robot a bit. And so I'm just going to kind of give you a little, little flyby. And then I'll, uh, I'm going to refer quickly to this, uh, this diagram, um, which is uh, used pretty frequently to explain some of the subsystems of the robot. Um, this is a, a relatively cursory treatment of what's going on inside, but um, I'll just speak to a few things that our team will get into today, uh, namely the IR receiver and transmitter um, pairings. Uh, IR stands for infrared. It's a, it's a wavelength of light that allows us to uh, perceive the world around us. And uh, those, that includes mechanical, electrical, firmware, robotic, uh, cooperation to make use of those sensors. Uh, additionally, I'll talk a bit about how we track uh, movement, specifically in the head uh, with potentiometers and on the wheels with, with optical encoders. Um, and then Francis will, will delve further into the type of processors used and, and what type of lifting those processors do on board. And, and David will wrap everything up by showing how we put together uh, sensor feedback data and convert it into uh, commands that our robot will act out in the world and, and provide a expected uh, behavior. So um, I'll switch quickly back to this camera just to show, to call out something before we go inside on the robot. Uh, some things of note on the outside are these uh, circles. There's two orange ones and, and one white one. And these are a proprietary uh, connector interface for our uh, accessories, mechanical accessories. We have a, a number of those in our in our product lineup. Um, here's an accessory connector in more of a detail look. Uh, this is how we attach uh, accessories to extend the function functionality of, of our robot. And so I'd like to just for a minute talk to you about how those things uh, work and, and kind of how they were designed. Um, so I'm gonna once again share with you uh, some slides will help me focus it. Here's a, a rendering of a robot, pretty pretty low, low resolution one. This is in a, a CAD platform where we design <clears throat> the components for the robot. This is a, a launcher uh, accessory. It allows us to throw projectiles, uh, ping pong sized balls uh, using the degrees of freedom provided by the, the head of the robot. And it takes advantage of several uh, accessory connection points. You can see two on the head, two on the rear <clears throat> sphere. And here's a, here's a second one as a pusher bar. Uh, while it connects to the same points on the robot, the manner in which it connects are quite, quite different. I'm going to try to explain that a bit here. Um, here are two detailed looks at accessory um, features. At the bottom here, you see on the left uh, something that was used in the launcher. Uh, it has notably longer kind of teeth here, uh, these, these flanges. And on these longer flanges, you'll notice these uh, triangular or kind of diamond-shaped facets. Uh, those provide uh, uh, resistance to rotation, uh, rotation prevention, actually, more specifically. Over here is the pusher bar uh, detailed view showing a shorter tooth and a, and a smooth beveled um, undercut here. And the reason for those will be evident as I, uh, as I show you um, my video and, and then this slide as well. I'll, I'll uh, 
I'll jump back to the video briefly here. So, so here's your, your dash, here's a, here's a pusher bar and it connects uh, to the front of the robot like so, like you saw in the, in the image in the rendering. And it kind of just plows the road. What you'll notice as I lift the robot up is this is, is able to rotate freely. It is a nice feature because it always have positive contact with the driving plane. Um, other types of accessories like this one, a building brick, allows us to interface with Lego compatible uh, bricks. You want it to have a more rigid and solid connection. And so you can see how this is not free spinning as well. <clears throat> the reason for that is because of the difference in the geometry of these two parts. And uh, it's easier to see in CAD. I'll just try to show you guys briefly so you can appreciate the difference in, in height of those two components. Uh, jump back and forth here. The, um, this is kind of the meat of, of the difference here. You'll see called out uh, different angles. These represent the, the degrees of uh, rotation provided by uh, these various uh, aspects of the, of the mechanical connection. Uh, these 15 degree uh, angles refer to those diamond shaped facets that you see up here. And then these 45 degree uh, angles uh, depicted refer to these uh, kind of square rectangular cutouts. Uh, those, those are um, intentional and depending on your application, uh, utilize uh, each, each aspect. So um, jumping back here to my, to my camera once more, um, I just snapped a accessory connector from the robot. It's been detached from the robot to a building brick. And if you notice on the uh, accessory connector itself, there are these four ribs, two horizontal and two vertical. Hopefully that's coming through. When those seat fully into the uh, building brick, those ribs engage at the at the root at the bottom of those uh, those teeth we showed you in CAD before. And what that that does is provide a very strong counter counter torque, so you can't slip um, position. Here on this uh, rabbit tail accessory we make, it has a shorter tooth, so it won't take advantage of those ribs we just showed you with the building brick. But it does have those uh, kind of diamond shaped facets and then those can kind of be stepped through at 15 degree intervals providing not as much uh, rotational resistance but more kind of functionality and it will will eject and then bring it back all the way to what we started with which is the the pusher bar having no rotational uh, resistance whatsoever so it really just depends on the application and uh and then you'll you'll take advantage of those features accordingly. Um, jumping now into uh, an inside look of the robot, hopefully switched over now. Yes, I think. Guys, tell me if that's visible um, on your screen. Can you guys see the, the chassis here? Francis and David? Yep, yep, right, cool. I can see it. Thanks. <clears throat> really tempting fate with these, all these camera changes. But uh, just really briefly, I wanted to show the main PCB. Uh, Jonathan is gonna provide a, a much deeper uh, look into that, but just to kind of show positionally where this, where this sits inside the robot, um, super cool. And, and Jonathan will get into that. Below, below that you see our main uh, gearbox and, and chassis for the robot. These uh, orange gears you see here control the, the pan movement, the side to side movement of the head, and I just have a dismembered head. Don't worry, this robot didn't feel any any pain. But uh, if I hold it just so, you may be able to appreciate subtle movement in the gear train, those orange gears, as the hand as the head pans in that axis of rotation. So that just kind of shows one of the uh, mechanical to mechanical interfaces, uh, just adjacent to that interface as another large gear on the top of which is a, is a small rib or wiper as we call it. And that is a molded feature which will engage with this electrical component. I will again try to, to get it somewhat in focus and somewhat so you can see daylight passing through the center of it under that white paper because that uh, potentiometer will sit on the wiper and track uh, where, where the head is um, relative to a, zero, a defined zero degree position. So that's, that's one um, mechanical electrical interface. Um, a second one that we mentioned in the overview uh, has to do with the 
uh, distance sensor pairings. Um, you can see them here in these black regions. It's a special type of plastic that permits infrared light to go through, but not visible light. Um, and behind those lenses, like this one, my hand here, you'll see uh, a PCB and wire harness, but on top of that is a, a black ABS housing cover. And uh, kind of the feature of that is, are these apertures, these special shaped holes. This is kind of a semicircular hole where I'm pointing now, and then a, a small pinhole on the other side. And those are to occlude the, the send and receive uh, emission of light uh, respectively so that we only focus light on where we intend to collect signal and where we want the robot to, to see. And um, I believe Jonathan will talk a bit more about that as well. And actually, I will show you uh, a little more of a closer look at, at those uh, features. Here's what we started at. This is kind of a look through um, the chassis that, that we just had disassembled. This big blue tube is our battery, and Jonathan will talk about that. Here's a, a closer look at the features I described. This red circle is an IR emitter, an LED, a light bulb. And we only want it to shine light forward and up above the, the drive plane. We don't want light to bounce off the, the ground plane to confuse the robot in, into thinking it sees something that isn't there. Similarly, we only want to look at reflected light above that horizon. So there's a, there's a marriage of, of mechanical and electrical <clears throat> design. And I will show one more component where I take up all of our time today. Uh, this is um, a motor that's used in, uh, in the drivetrain of our, of our robot. Um, this silver uh, cylinder here is the motor can itself. It has a clear silicone um, sleeve over it, which is used to dampen uh, vibration and reduce noise in the system. It also gets it to seat nicely inside the gearbox. Press fit onto the shaft of that motor is a another ABS component, which features both uh, some gear teeth to engage in our gear train, but really importantly has this wheel at the end. And I'll try to rotate it a bit so you can appreciate that there is there is daylight passing through there. And this is an encoder wheel. Each of these holes, these apertures are called ticks that correlate to the distance traveled by the, the drive system, the drive train. Some math is required there. You have to take into account your gear ratio and also the size of the drive wheels. But this type of information collected by our electrical system used by firmware and our robotic, roboticist uh, can equate to odometry, which is the measurement of distance traveled. Um, and I will just show again really quickly one more uh, detailed look. Apologize for the whiplash going back and forth. But here is the, the same kind of sub-assembly we just looked at. The red part is a gear and coder wheel combination, a plastic ABS part, press fit onto a, a motor, which has this, in this image, a gold sleeve, but it, it's clear in the example I showed. Um, so these are, these are just examples of where uh, the work I do hands off to our electrical team. And in, in that spirit, I will hand the, the mic over to Jonathan now. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chuck. So, we're just talking about the encoder wheel. Um, and that's just one of the many electromechanical interfaces um, that the electronics inside of Dash uh, interface with all the inner workings that Chuck just explained. So to take a look at how that encoder ring sits within the electronics, we actually have this very interesting uh, circuit board here with the additional black plastic blinders. And so if I take this uh, plastic part off the circuit board, you can see uh, two sets of IR components, uh, IR transmitters and IR receivers. And so that encoder wing with the ticks spins inside of this, breaking the beam and then allowing the beam to complete again. Um, and so as that happens many times per second, uh, this creates an electrical digital signal that our microcontrollers can detect and therefore start counting the ticks to determine the odometry that, that uh, Chuck was mentioning. Francis and David later will talk about how that information is used to actually do meaningful things with our robot. Um, so let's take a step back for a moment and look at the entire subsystem of electronics that is inside of DASH. And so what you can see here in front of me um, are a collection of the 12 circuit boards that make up DASH's electronic system. Uh, starting with the main board here, this is the largest one and includes three microcontrollers. Uh, these processors are all used for different things. The first one, which you see up here on the, this top small daughter board, is the Bluetooth microcontroller. This establishes the communication between your Chromebook or your iPad uh, and the electronics inside of DASH. Francis will talk about how we are able to use that connection to, to send data back and forth and do important things like firmware update. Um, but for now, in terms of electronics, 
this microcontroller also talks to the other two microcontrollers on this board, which are on the bottom surface. You can see one here up front and one here in the rear. Both of these use diff are, are serving different purposes. One is basically used for uh, driving and motion control, and the other one is used for interfaces such as the LEDs, the buttons, and uh, playing sounds and, and audio features. Uh, included also on the circuit board are two different flash memories. These are used to store audio files, uh, animations, and, and other configuration data. Up in this corner, you can see the battery charging circuitry. So the battery, as Chuck mentioned, is installed in the chassis here in the gearbox. Unfortunately, mine's not clear. Uh, but you can see right here, this is the wire harness coming off of the battery that is installed in here. This is an 18650 battery cell. It's the same one that they're using electric vehicles like Tesla's, um, Nissan Leafs, and, and other those types of vehicles. We're only using one, whereas they're using thousands of those in their battery packs. But it's the same technology at the heart of it. Um, taking a look at some of these smaller boards that are coming off of this main uh, main circuit board, we can trace the wire harness up to the head. And so here you can see the familiar eye of Dash. And attached to that, you can see this board with the four buttons, which would be on the very top of his head, and each of the ears, which feature RGB LEDs. So taking off the familiar plastic parts of his eye, you can see what's underneath here. So here we've got the 12 white LEDs in a circular pattern. Um, and inside of that, you can see that there are two infrared receivers. These are used to detect the IR beacon signals that are coming from other dash and dots that are in the environment. Um, and that's how they can exchange data and know that uh, the presence um, of another robot nearby. On the back side of that board, we can see all the circuitry used to control those signals, as well as uh, an additional potentiometer. These are basically variable resistors that are attached to the gearbox. And so as in, in this case, as the motor moves and the head tilts up and down, the microcontroller and electronics are able to measure the current angle of the head. And so this way we're able to control, you know, if we tell Dash to look up, we know did Dash actually look up or how far did he move? And Francis and David will talk about how we can use that to create very accurate animations uh, and other dance moves by Dash. Coming back down the harness a little bit to the main board, you'll see that we've got a variety of sensors hanging off the front and rear. As Chuck mentioned, we have uh, infrared sensors used to detect the proximity of nearby items. So we've got two in the front and one in the rear. Uh, underneath the hood of these, both of them are, are basically the same as, as Chuck was explaining. We've got some uh, mechanical blinders so that we can control the field of view of each of the sensors. Um, basically, on one side of the blinder, we have the IR transmitting diode. So this is just flooding the area with infrared light. On the other side of that blinder is a infrared receiver. And so it's only sensitive to infrared light. If you take a regular flashlight and shine it out there, it's not going to have an impact on the measured signal because that's visible light. Um, we don't want those types of things in the environment to impact the, the measurements and accuracy. So we're only looking for the reflected infrared light. And so based on the amount of reflected light, we can determine how near Dash is to bumping into an object either in front of it uh, or behind it. And so again, we use that type of information along with the odometry from the wheel encoders and one other sensor that I'm going to talk about in a moment to create Dash's accurate driving. Um, and so how we really determine the uh, location and driving skills and, you know, basically the fine tuning movements of, of Dash, in particular while he's drawing items with uh, SketchKit, um, we have a six axis IMU. An IMU is an inertial measurement unit and it basically gives us the ability to detect the uh, what, how Dash is being oriented and how he's moving both in terms of linear X, Y, and Z directions, as well as in angular directions, such as ro rotations about uh, the varying axes. So David will explain how we use that information uh, to have very fine control of over Dash's movements. Um, additionally, there's one other thing that I'd like to show here. This is what we call like the neck board. And so th this sits inside of Dash behind the black plastic part all around his collar. So Chuck's gonna show that real quick. That is also the same type of plastic material that's around the uh, proximity sensors where it passes, uh, allows infrared light to pass through but blocks out visible light. And so underneath that, we've got four transmitting IR LEDs mounted in these orange posts. And this is what are sending out the digital information over IR to let other dashes nearby know, hey, I'm a dash, I'm nearby, you can get this information, you know. These features are exposed in our apps, and so this is how uh, robot to robot communication is achieved. Additionally, on this assembly, you can see that there are three microphones, two mounted here on the circuit board, and the third one is mounted inside the enclosure that holds the speaker. Uh, this is what allows Dash to determine uh, the presence of sound and to look towards its location or its original sound source. Um, additionally, here you, from the underside, you can see 
Uh, the speaker is mounted there as well. And then again, this assembly also connects back to the main circuit board. So with that, we're going to hand this over to Francis, who's going to talk about how, you know, all these electronics on the board, once they're assembled there, even if you connect the battery, it doesn't do anything until it's loaded with code. And so Francis is going to talk about how we've created firmware that actually brings these electronics to life. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. Let me know when you guys can see it. Looks good. All right, great. Oh, uh, so yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, talk about what firmware is. Um, let's take a look at what we know so far. Uh, first, we start with the hardware. Um, Jonathan gave us a good overview of the different kinds of electronics inside Dash. It consisted of all the physical sensors, motors, processors, and all the electrical components that you can see and touch physically. Now, all of these make up the hardware. As you can see there, you see some, uh, some CAD drawings there of the, of the uh, main board, some of the circuit boards, and also, you know, all the things that, that uh, Jonathan showed you just now. Um, and the next part is the software. Now, this should be more familiar to all of us, as these are the applications that we download from the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. These software applications run on our mobile devices platforms like Android, iOS, Chromebooks, and desktops like Mac OS and Windows. However, these applications like Blockly and Wonder, they can't talk directly to Dash hardware. Um, we're going to need a layer in between that can talk to both software and hardware. And that's where firmware comes in. Um, firmware is code or a set of instructions that run directly on the physical hardware. It resides in the memory on the robot's processors, and it can talk directly to the hardware components. Um, firmware has the ability to control all the hardware components and also talk to the software applications wirelessly via Bluetooth. The firmware implements many different kinds of protocols to be able to send and receive data from the sensors, motors, speakers, and microphone. So you can think of protocols as all the different languages that each of those components can speak. Uh, and there are many of them, I2C, SPI, for the motors, you need to do PWM, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and firmware is pretty much everywhere around us. They're in microwaves, televisions, stoplights, elevators, to name a few. Pretty much anything that has a processor, no matter how simple or advanced, will have some firmware running on it. Now, take a, now we'll, we'll go ahead and take a look at all the processors that Dash have. Uh, Chuck and, and Jonathan mentioned that we have three of them. Uh, so let's, let's get into it and see what they do. So each processor has their own unique firmware that executes on them. Uh, first, we'll go over the uh, main processor. So the main processor manages a lot of the communication to and from the applications and also manages the communication to all the other processors as well. Um, some of the things that it does is Bluetooth. Dash uses BTLE, which stands for Bluetooth Low Energy. It's a standard that many toys and wearables use because of its low power features. Um, the main processor also takes care of the battery. It can read the battery levels and know when to charge and stop charging. It can also read the status of the power button and, and take care of the boot up process. So Dash can detect whenever a button is pressed and know when to boot up and power up all the rest of the processors. So the main processor is responsible for bringing up the other processors as well. And it can also do animations. Uh, the main processor loads up and plays the animations. David Cole will cover this more later. And lastly, the main processor also takes care of USB and our factory functionalities. In the factory, we use the USB to calibrate the sensors and validate dash functionality. This is so we know that we built the robot very well. And last but not the least is the firmware update. This is a very important part of what the main processor does. And I'll cover this more later. Now let's take a look at the second and the third processors. What do they do? Um, an important part of robotics is the real-time aspect of it. The main processor does so many things already that it needs help, to be honest, to control other sensors and components. As Jonathan showed you, we have so many sensors and components and they're all very complex. And these all need to happen very quickly and almost instantaneously. For example, when you're coding and using distance sensors to avoid objects, the moment Dash sees an obstacle, it needs to react to it immediately. 
Otherwise, it'll crash into that object. If one processor was to do all that work, we risk missing important events and sensor data. So what we've done is we've designed the robot electronics and firmware to offload these important real-time tasks to other processors. Here, the second processor handles the sound playback, the microphone, the beacon transmit, and all the lights connected to its head, the accelerometer that Jonathan went over, and the gyro. The accelerometer and gyro are all part of that inertial uh, system that Jonathan talked about. And the third processor then handles the motors and all the robot movements, and also takes care of receiving the beacon signals. Um, this way, the main processor can always be listening and processing commands from Blockly and Wonder via Bluetooth while the other processors are helping to send and get data to and from the sensors and the motors. They're all working together to kind of make Dash work as a system. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned that the main processor does is firmware update. In the next slide, we'll, I'll show you what that does and what it's for. So an important part of the firmware is to actually update itself. But how does it do that? There's a lot of detail and complexity involved in this process, but I want to give an overview of just what happens during firmware update. And this is something you're probably familiar with if you played with Dash before. Um, whenever you see a new version of Blockly, usually sometimes we have a new version of firmware and the apps will tell you that you need to update your firmware. Here I'll walk you through what happens during firmware update. I don't know if you've noticed, but on our robots, they go into a special mode called DFU which stands for device firmware update. This is where you see dash ears and buttons all turn red. This mode allows dash to update its main firmware. It's a very special mode that dash is in. So what happens? Well, first the firmware comes as part of the software applications. So when you download an app from the app store, the app will have at least the latest and greatest firmware up to that release. So it's the first step the app sends a firmware to Dash via Bluetooth. You see the padlock icon there because firmware is encrypted. What does that mean? It means only the robot can know what's inside that data. Now that the main processor has the encrypted firmware in its memory, it can then decrypt it and look inside what the type of data it is. So now you see the main processor then sees that the data received is a firmware update and that the received firmware is a more recent version. The main processor will then update itself and the rest of the other processors. Once all the firmware are in place, Dash then reboots so that the new firmware can run. But we're not quite done yet. Now the second part of the update is for the sounds and other resources. Um, the second processor who is in charge of the sound playback um, is the one that receives all the sound files. So again, the sound files come from the application and sent via Bluetooth. It is then received by the main processor and gets routed to the second processor who stores all the sound files in a separate memory. It'll keep doing this until the newer sounds have been updated. It will also make sure that the existing sounds are good and not corrupted or broken. If so, the application will send those files as well to fix the broken and corrupted files. So every time you do a firmware update, after that, you can rest assured that your firmware is in a good state and also all your sound files are good. Once this is all is done, then the app, is, uh, the app continues and you can now use your Dash with its freshly updated firmware and resources. And there you have it, the overview of what firmware update does and what it is. However, even though now we can communicate with the apps on your tablet and also control hardware, we still need to give Dash its own personality and really do something cool and meaningful with all the sensors, motors, audio, since now we can control them via firmware. And that's where our roboticist David Cole comes in. David will tell you more about that cool stuff. Cool, thank you, Francis. So now that uh, Francis has explained how firmware can talk with hardware components, let's talk a little bit about integrating all of these sensor signals and motor outputs to give Dash their personality. So first we'll show you a video of Dash doing what we call an animation, which is basically a choreographed dance that combines body movements, head movements, LED lights, and eye patterns. In order to achieve this effect, many different sensor and actuator subsystems must function together in a fast, stable, and predictable way. 
So to create a new animation, our artists and animators first developed the animation in Maya, which is a popular 3D modeling and animation program. So Chuck, if you would please play the first video. Happy to do it. Are you guys seeing the, the video on screen now? Yep, yep, I can see it. Hello. Hello. So this is the vision that the animators want Dash to, to do. So how do we do this? So first, the animation is broken down into discrete keyframes. And each keyframe contains information about the robot's head and body positions, as well as the LED lights and eye patterns. Uh, the robot receives about 10 of these keyframes every second. And in real time, tweens between the motions produce a smooth animation. So next, we'll have a video of the actual physical Dash robot doing the same exact animation. So Chuck, please roll video number two. Cool. And just as an example, finally, I hope most of you are aware of our Dash simulation project. Uh, this last video, just for fun, is a video of our current progress of our simulated Dash playing the same exact animation that we just saw two times before. So check, please, video number three. Hello. 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 You'll notice that the simulated version might look a little bit different because the camera is following the face of the robot. But hopefully, you'll notice that it's actually the same animation. So to achieve this desired effect, the head must be able to point to commanded positions, the wheels have to be able to move, the body of the robot, where we want it, when we want it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, all this requires different levels of controls called control systems to control the various electric motors to make Dash do what we want. On Dash, the control systems we use to control the head and wheels are called PID controllers, which are a type of closed loop control system. So let me just show you a quick graphic here. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Sure. And bam. All right, can you guys see this? Yes. So this is a very typical diagram of a closed loop control system. And um, so basically what we do, what closed loop means is that we repeatedly sense and control uh, an element, like a motor. So let's take, as an example of a closed loop control system on Dash, let's take a look at just one wheel. So the control system, which is basically a firmware program, takes a reading from the wheel encoder, compares that reading with where we want the wheel to be, and then calculates a force to apply the wheel. So if we follow this diagram, this block right here represents the encoder reading, so the current position, measured position of the wheel. That information is used by the controller along with the desired position, which is set either by the user or an animation, and then this block right here is the controller. So this is a, a big algorithm that they, takes these two things and calculates what kind of output we want to give to Francis's firmware motor driver. That motor driver then drives the motor, and then the whole thing happens again over and over again. This happens hundreds of thousands of times a second, depending on the controller and what's being controlled. So each one of these controllers has a set of variables and attributes called gains that must be tuned properly to achieve the desired stable effect. So a badly tuned control system might take too long to reach its target, or it might oscillate, or be completely unstable. So just for fun, let's take an example of a poorly tuned control system. Let's take a video of us trying to tune one of the control systems that drives Dash in a straight line. So this control system uses Dash's gyroscope to measure its current heading, and tries to maintain a straight heading over time by modulating wheel speeds. So let's take a look. Oh, it's, yeah. I took you over there, but hopefully that's expected. Yep, yep, no, that's good. Yeah, let's take a look. Okay. Hang on, let me. Uh... So hopefully you can notice that the line isn't very straight. It's a little bit wobbly. It's, it's probably deviating from a straight path by over an inch. So uh, first, uh, by sort of intuition, uh, 
we kind of guess that perhaps the control system uh, needs to be tightened. Uh, what we mean by that is we might need to increase the gains, which if we were to compare this to a car, it would be like asking the driver to course correct harder and faster if you're off course. So we want dash to be a little bit more forceful in, in maintaining that straight line. So uh, just for fun, we increased what is called the integrator gain, which is one of the gains of the control system, which was at four, we increased it all the way to 120, which is multiple orders of magnitude. So let's see what happens when we do this. So check video number five, please. So obviously that didn't work. We can see that the line, it, it actually is much straighter but Dash enters this unstable oscillation as it gains some speed. And this is very, very typical of an unstable oscillating response of a control system if the gain values are set too high. Um, in a car, it would be like overcorrecting over and over again. So finally, last video, uh, here's a video of the same Dash with a much more moderate, modest increase in integrator gain, which we increased from four to 12. So let's see how it does. Next video, please check. Oh yeah, I recovered pretty good. Not the casting boys, but I'm telling you. Okay, I'll play it again. <laughs> <laughs> it out. Cool. So yeah, as you can see, that is much much better. So once we settle on a good version of the control system. They're merged into the firmware and sent to you as firmware updates or to the factory to load onto our brand new Dash robots. So I hope you enjoy this uh, brief look inside some of the control systems inside Dash and some sort of the, some of the, how we use the sensors to do some of this stuff. And I hope it, uh, you appreciate how non-trivial even driving in a straight line can be. So thank you very much. Chuck, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, David. And uh, you, know, you mentioned that intuition was helpful in trying to arrive at the right gain value, but Intuition is a funny thing, and as you may have heard in the in the background, sometimes our intuition is that uh, another system on the robot may be responsible for a, a substandard result. And while we, you know, have a great working relationship and we're joking around with each other, it does speak to the fact that we rely on each other's expertise and discipline to create a you know comprehensive product like like the Dash robot. And in this case, uh, David saved our bacon by adjusting the gain value, and I I was very relieved that it wasn't the caster wheel which is another uh, sub-assembly that's entirely mechanical. And uh, usually that's the, uh, the repository for, um, for unwanted behaviors as a mechanical bucket. But anyway, it's, um, it's humbling and, and very fulfilling experience working with such a talented and capable team. And we're glad we were able to talk with you all today and look forward to fielding some of your questions or, or just chatting more about Dash. So we'll throw it back to Brian, who will uh, curate the Q&A session now. Thanks.